Uh, my name is Reverend Leslie Goodwin, and I want to welcome you all to this amazing community where we do amazing things together. And folks that are watching online, hello, please know that we feel you, we love you. You are an amazing part of our congregation, so please connect. You're important to us. My talk title today is so personal. So I'm going to ask us to start for us to do that thing where we rub our hands together and build up some energy of love and then cast it out to fill this whole room like it's a bubble of support and joy and love and compassion because odds are some of us are going to get our buttons pushed this morning and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So I'm going to lean on that love. If you need it, lean on the love that's in this room right now. So my talk today is, I'm sick. Does that mean I'm not spiritual? Our teaching has a problem. Our teaching has a big problem. And it is oversimplification of the logic of Reverend Dr. Ernest Holmes, our founder, who taught us beautifully in about 67,000 books <laughs> that our thoughts become things and the way life becomes the way it is is an outpicturing of our predominant thinking over time. Yes? And sometimes we get confused if we've, you know, watched The Secret. I'm the only one that watched that, right? Or we've picked up one of those awesome pop culture books on New Thought or on Law of Attraction that we, we think it's very literal, that if I get cancer, it's because I've been walking around going, cancer, 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 cancer. Nobody does that, right? Nobody does that. But we hear, I hear, every day. I'm not kidding, y'all. Every day. What am I doing wrong? What does this mean? Why am I failing at religious science over and over again because I'm sick, because I'm injured, because I fell, because I got hurt? Am I not good enough? Does God not hear me? Do I not belong here? Do I not belong here because I'm suffering? Let yourself feel that. That someone in your midst right now has asked, should I not be here because I'm not good enough to pray away my broken ankle or my cancer? or my autoimmune disorder. That's not what he meant. If I could raise him up and bring him on the stage to tell you himself, I would, y'all I would. But you're just gonna have to take it from me on this one. It's not what he meant. That's an extreme oversimplification of our teaching. How can we be a center that radically includes and deeply accepts everyone no matter what? If we're then teaching, but you know what? If you're sick, it's your fault. If you're suffering, it's, it's, it's on you. You did it. Fix it. Fix it. That's not what the teaching means. If it did, I wouldn't be here. Straight up, I would not be here. I would not be here because, hello, those of you who don't know, I have an autoimmune disorder, and it's something that I've been walking out pretty publicly over the last couple of years. And I wouldn't be here because I don't want to be part of a movement that closes its door or its heart on its members when they struggle, right? None of us want that, do we? And yet, there is this dangerous cliff we can fall off of when we oversimplify the teaching that means some of us, I mean, none of us have thrown anybody off a cliff, but some of us might have gone, 
without realizing it, y'all, if you didn't see that, it was this. <clears throat> without realizing it, because of the phrases we use without thinking about it. I don't get sick. It's not in my consciousness. Well, that's awesome until you do. And then what? Did your consciousness get stabbed? Did you suddenly become a different person who hadn't studied what you've studied? I've never heard someone actually ask, what is in your consciousness? In the bad old days in the 80s, we used to hear people would say, what is in your consciousness that you're sick? I've never actually heard that. But I have heard things like, well, aren't you doing your spiritual practice? It's a great reminder to do our spiritual practice. But what if they are? What if they are? What, do we think they're not doing it well enough? Do we think they're not doing it right? Or my all-time favorite, sickness isn't real. Illness isn't real. It's an illusion. I need a wand for that. An illusion. Ernest Holmes specifically said, we don't have to deny the existence of a symptom or an illness, or an injury. We deny the power of the illness, or the sickness, or the injury to be a cause of how their life is. We look through the sickness, or the illness, or injury to the spiritual truth behind it. We don't look away. We don't say it's not there. Try telling a person with a broken leg that their leg is not broken. Good luck to you, my friend. We look through to the spiritual truth. And anchoring into that is what makes this illness, injury, whatever, surrender to the natural process of healing. So I have three steps of healing that I want to walk us through today together. If you are someone who is currently needing a healing, it's going to be real obvious what parts are for you. Those of you who are not in need of a healing may find yourself in this talk too. Please deepen into it because what I'm going to share is at the heart of compassion for the people in our midst who are the most vulnerable, the most in need of our support and understanding and compassion. So the first one is breathe. Stop this crazy train of, I'm doing it wrong. What am I missing? What does it mean? What is God trying to tell me? I'm screwing it up. It just keeps getting worse. That, stop, stop, and breathe with me right now. See how different that feels already? We know about the law of attraction that we get that which we put out into the universe, right? Self-flagellation and negativity and beating ourselves up and holding ourselves accountable for things that we can't possibly control in this moment is a terrible energy to call in healing. All of that, do, 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 I didn't, I need to, I can't, I'm failing, is deepening the energetic of the illness. Breathe. There's a really big difference between it's my fault and, oh, there are tools I can use to help my healing. Doesn't that feel different? It's the same statement. Or at least it flows from the same logic. I have ankylosing spondylitis. Try to say that three times fast. I am so open to a healing, a profound cure. I am. And I am very clear that focusing on the fact that I have not achieved, accomplished, received that yet does nothing nothing to move me into a better, healthier, fuller life. 
All it does is stop me from being able to do the things I can do. The flip side of that is there's a power in this universe and we can use it. So just accepting where we're at and then entering into this idea of, okay, what can I do with the law of attraction from here? What can I do with spiritual practice from here? What can I do with my practitioner sessions from here? So that I am both receiving the depth of the possibility of learning from the experience I'm having. I don't believe God gives us things to test us. I don't think this is a message. But I do know I can learn from everything that's put in my path. Learn to be more compassionate and kind to people who are suffering. Learn to slow down. Whatever is yours to learn. But that, doesn't that feel a lot different than, well, I'm a religious scientist and I know that I'm sick because it's my fault and I suck. <laughs> as early as the 80s, or as most recently as the 80s, they would not have licensed me as a minister because I have not demonstrated wholeness consciousness, y'all. That's true. That's true in this teaching, in the history of this teaching. And it's something we have to acknowledge. It's wrong. It was wrong. We're fixing it. There's also this thing called race consciousness, which is the worst named thing in the world. But that's, what, that's what Ernest Holmes called it, race consciousness. And it's the idea that there's a collected preponderance of thought and energy and belief in any given culture or population that kind of is a nebulous cloud of stuff everybody knows. The pollen count is high. Allergies will go up. If you don't wear your seatbelt, you could get hurt in a car crash. You know the stuff everybody knows. We're not allowed to spoil Game of Thrones. <laughs> That's a dangerous one, right? So here's the thing with, with race consciousness. When we lean into the, what am I doing wrong? It's my fault. Race consciousness is this ball of thought that sort of just is in the air. You know that stuff you know, you don't know, you don't remember anybody telling you, you just know it? It's probably race consciousness. And that will be what you experience unless you consciously replace it with something else. Because it's the vibe that's, in the space, right? The two-year-old didn't earn cancer. It's race consciousness. As a culture, we believe cancer exists. The rape victim did not invite the violation. It's race consciousness. Our culture believes violence exists. So what do we do? We don't blame. We sit on the top of that and we look at law of attraction and what we know about our teaching, and we say, from here, what can I do? With these tools, what can I do now to precipitate my own healing and to alter the race consciousness? That's why it's so important that we get together in groups and talk about this stuff, because we are also putting things into that race consciousness. And slowly, if you believe Oprah, the consciousness of the society is changing I was listening to a podcast from my favorite stand-up comic the other day, and she's like, I'm working on my manifestation. Like, really? It's everywhere now. And this is a good thing. So what do we do? We surrender. Everybody's favorite topic, right? I usually hear a groan when I say surrender. We surrender to the idea that there is great mystery here. We do not love mystery as a people. We do not love paradox. But the true truth is, the deeper you go into any teaching, the more likely you are to hit that place where we do not know because our human brain cannot comprehend the infinitude of the consciousness of all life. We can try to explain it. We can develop tools to work with it. But we don't know. There are mysteries here. And the best thing we can do is surrender into that. But we are so intolerant of ambiguity. And we cling to our belief, our superstitious false belief. I'm going to say it again. Our superstitious false belief that good people don't get sick. We're carrying that around because we're good people, right? 
like a talisman, like a, like a shield, like Captain America's shield is going to protect us. But then when something happens, oh, I'm not a good person? That's not what he meant. That's not what our teaching says in the depths of it. He said the healing of sickness is not accomplished by the denial of sickness, nor by the strenuous affirmation of health, but rather by the quiet and insistent recognition of the divine spirit of life which is even now present within every life, even though we may be unconscious of its healing presence. The quiet, insistent recognition of divine spirit that is in us now. What is there to know about God in this? What is there to learn in this, right where I am, whole, perfect, and complete, exactly as I am, while I stand here feeling so ill, I want to cry. I might actually cry. They give me tissues. They're nice. And when we allow ourselves to sit in that place, we're in a place to receive. To receive the loving support of family and friends and center members who love us. When we're in the state of believing we deserve the illness we got because we must not be good people or we must not be using the law right or we must be screwing it up somehow, do we believe we deserve the love of family and friends and congregants? Not really. We're blocking that. We're blocking that love and support as it's offered. We see it. We say we appreciate it, but we are energetically closed to it. Nothing heals like love. Right? Nothing heals like love. We have to let it in. We let in and receive the spiritual support of our ministers and our practitioners. When we hide what's going on with us because we are embarrassed, because we are ashamed, because we think we should be better than this or beyond this, or I've taken 17 classes, I should know better, right? When we hide what's going on with us because of that, we are closing ourselves off from the spiritual support of the people that are best trained to help us pull it forward. Open up to it. Talk to us. We're here. We're here for every single one of you. And you. And we open up to receive an experience of the wholeness of God right where we are. In practitioner training, we are very, very clear, and it doesn't always shake out to the rest of the congregation and the universe. We're very clear about the difference between a healing and a cure. A healing is mental and spiritual. A cure is physical. And in religious science, we work in the the level of energetics, in the level of spirit, not in the level of effect or the body, right? Because this is where change happens. This is just what pops out of the gumball machine. We want a good gumball, but, you know, that's not where the action's happening. It's here. And we're very clear that you always get a healing. You pray... Believing, you always get a healing. You always get a shift in your consciousness that moves you closer to alignment with the truth of who you are. And lots of times you get a cure, which is an alleviation of the experience of whatever the physical ailment is. But they are not the same. You always get a healing. And we work towards a cure. But the healing sometimes is the letting yourself off the freaking hook for every miserable thing that ever happens and softening enough that you can allow yourself, that we can allow ourselves to feel the love of the divine and actually have a better experience. That's healing. And medical science tells us that that place of soft acceptance is the physical reality that invites the actual cure. We can't physically heal while we're in this state. 
Our bodies aren't built that way. Our hearts aren't built that way. Only in the state of believing we deserve it just because we're here, just because we are. The love of one another, the love of the divine, the support of the people who are here, literally, it's, it's our job, literally, to be here, to do that. All of that leads us into a more spiritual life, a more anchored life, and a more healthy life. Larry Dossie, the author of our book of the month, said, the real cure is the realization that at the most essential level, we are all untouchables, utterly beyond the ravages of disease and death. Michael Beckwith says, there's a part of you that's never been hurt or damaged or harmed in any way. It's that part of you that invites the healing, that makes the cure possible. We've got to be kind to ourselves. We've got to be kind to one another. Soft. Soft with one another's very precious hearts. So our call to action is to breathe. When this kicks up in you, breathe. Stop the crazy. Surrender into the love of the divine that we all know is there. Let that be enough. And then receive all the good that comes from that place. Receive that healing. So it is. So let's anchor that into prayer. Here is what I know. There is only one, one God, and it is love. It is wholeness and truth and beauty and the space where all of that comes together. It is in everyone and everything because it is literally the only stuff and substance that there is. We all have to be made of it. It's, it's all there is to be. And so as I know this truth, I anchor in for everyone within the sound of my voice that each one of us is an expression of that one. And the pure and perfect wholeness of the divine is right at the center of our being. Whether we feel it right now or not, whether there is an illness or an injury or a broken heart covering that whole truth, it's still there. It's still right there. We cannot be separate from God. It's the truth of who and what we are. And so I know for each one of us, an allowing, a softening, an inviting in of the healing love of oneness, allowing it to radiate through every part of our being and washing away, taking off like, like layers of scarves, anything that appears to block its path, any symptom, any injury, any emotion, that seems to cover up that wholeness so that it can radiate forth, fully revealed as the wholeness that has always been the truth of who we are. That's what the divine lives and breathes through each one of us. And I know and affirm for each of us that we invite in the loving support of those who hold us high. I know for each one of us that we speak with compassion and kindness and softness to anyone who is in struggle, gently inviting them into a higher state of consciousness as a reminder of what we know they know, that God is and all is well. And as this happens in each one of us, an alchemical thing happens throughout our center that ripples out into all of new thought and all of society. For it is okay to be okay, no matter what is happening. It's all God, all is well. There's nothing wrong. I trust it, I know it, I'm so thankful for it the wholeness and the goodness and the love that each one of us are. 
I call it very, very good. And so it is. <laughs>